At the dawn of the 21st century, science seems on the verge of exposing many of nature's most treasured secrets. Yet for all the spectacular successes, the vast realms of the oceans remain a mystery. Beneath the waves are worlds of immense richness and diversity, which we have only just begun to explore. But as our understanding grows, scientists have come to appreciate the appalling toll which mankind's millennia of abuse have wrought upon this unknown world. Coral reefs are among the most spectacularly beautiful sites in the sea. They are also of huge economic and environmental importance. Yet until the invention of scuba equipment in the 1940s, they were unexplored and little understood. Coral reefs are incredibly diverse ecosystems. They are often called the rainforests of the sea because literally millions of species of, of every kind and variety are associated with coral reefs. Corals are usually very tiny animals. They live in colonies, um, often thousands, tens of thousands, even millions of individual animals all living together, and they secrete a skeleton made of calcium carbonate, effectively limestone. And over years, decades, millennia, they build up huge physical structures, which are what we call coral reefs. Hard corals are extremely slow growing. Some of the, the massive corals, like brain corals, for example, may only grow a couple of millimeters in a year. Some of the faster branching corals um, can grow up to 15 centimeters in a year. But all of that means that coral reefs in general are very, very slow growing. So if we look at the fastest growing reefs, we're probably saying about 10 to 15 meters in a thousand years. As with any ecosystem, but particularly these mega-diverse ecosystems, we're just on the tip of, of understanding the complexity. I mean, the, the sheer numbers of, of organisms and of individuals, it's estimated that there could be two, even three million species on coral reefs. So far, we've described probably 90,000 of them. So nine, over 90% of the, of the animals and plants on a coral reef have not even been described by scientists. Coral reefs have been identified for centuries as rich fishing grounds and on naval charts as navigational hazards. But no concerted effort had been made to produce an accurate global atlas detailing the distribution of reefs around the world. In 1993, scientists working at World Conservation Monitoring Centre based in Cambridge in the UK decided to embark on the task of pulling all the disparate information about reefs together. Eight years later, they finally completed the World Atlas of Coral Reefs. We were following in the footsteps of some pretty uh, great people, I suppose. Charles Darwin was the first person to produce a world map of coral reefs. Um, and he, he, he essentially followed the same method as we did, of gathering data from numerous different sources around the world and drawing them onto a map. To construct the atlas, scientists drew on a diverse range of material, from old British admiralty charts to the latest satellite imagery, drawing together information into a coherent global picture of the state of the world's coral reefs that goes far beyond the limitations of a traditional atlas. The maps not only show you where a reef is, a point in space, but they have linked information about the diversity in a particular country, about the protected areas that have been set aside to try and stem the, the rising tide of, of damage and threat to coral reefs on a country-by-country -country basis. One thing that we confirmed is that there was actually less coral reef than we had previously suspected, some 15% less. And so we refined our, that particular estimate. We confirmed most people's predictions that there are very, very few coral reefs, if indeed none at all, that haven't been impacted in some way by human activities. Really, there is no such thing as an untouched or pristine coral reef left. Coral reefs are a major conservation issue for us to be worrying about at the minute, and most of the impacts and pressures on reefs are human-caused. We have really four main categories of problems facing reefs, pollution, sedimentation, climate change, and overfishing. 
Tanzania, on Africa's east coast, is typical of many of the countries with large coral reefs. The Tanzanian people depend heavily on fishing as their major source of protein, and as the population has grown, so too has its destructive impact on its reefs. The economic and ecological consequence of continued careless exploitation has awakened the Tanzanian government to the importance of saving their marine environment. Before 1990, we didn't have the environment policy to tell the people why it's important to conserve their resources. That the corals, for example, are the, the homes of fish. The, it's a shelter, nursery and breeding ground of fish. So when they destroy them, then they will have no fish for the future generation. And that the corals are, are living uh, uh, resources. They're not stones like some fishermen think. Situated off the southern coast of Tanzania, Mafia Island is widely recognized as one of the most important fisheries in the country. And it was here in 1991 that the Tanzanian government, in conjunction with the World Wildlife Fund, established the country's first marine reserve. The park actually came into being after a very long process here. A lot of consultation were carried out, especially with the local community. As you are aware that uh, we've got a very big, rather large population residing in the park. We've got about 18,000 people living in the park, almost one third of the population of uh, Mafia Island here. As the first marine park in Tanzania, the World Wildlife Fund played an integral role in helping to develop legislation and management strategy. Jason Rubens is the World Wildlife Fund's representative in Mafia. The marine park is around 820 square kilometers, which makes it the largest marine protected area uh, in the Indian Ocean. The people that live within and around the marine park are poor communities. Uh, they're poor even by Tanzanian standards. And there are not so many options for many of the communities outside of fishing and harvesting marine resources uh, on which they could depend. The challenges facing the marine park were numerous, but halting the process of environmental destruction was their first priority. The worst aspect of this was the prevalence of dynamite fishing. Dynamite fishing is not only indiscriminate, but causes massive damage to reefs. Structures which have taken centuries to build are destroyed in an instant, along with the habitats of future generations of fish. In those days, up to 70 incidents of explosives could be heard in one day. Those fishermen were not from here. They came from Dar es Salaam. The strategy that was used was to set up a network amongst the villages, specifically setting up a radio network which enabled villages to report incidences of dynamite fishing. WWF also provided a high-powered, high-performance patrol boat, which was essential in order, obviously, to be able to chase down and make arrests when dynamite fishing was reported. So that collaboration between the marine park and communities with support from WWF was, yeah, critical. The elimination of dynamite fishing was a major achievement for the park and an important element in winning the trust of the community. But it was by no means the only destructive fishing method. The use of seine nets was widespread, huge nets laid to form a loop, effectively trapping every fish caught within its boundary. The problem with seine netting is twofold. One is that the uh, the act of dragging a net through certain marine habitats is obviously destructive, especially if it's a coral reef environment. The second one is that the mesh size that's used is often very small, even down to a quarter or half an inch. And that uh, obviously takes out a lot of small juvenile fish and that affects the productivity of, of other fisheries. So it's, a, it's effectively a self-defeating fishing method in the long term. Same net fishing was also a divisive issue within the local community. They have really affected me. Fish stocks are down in those areas where dragnets are used. In order to get fish now, I have to go far out to sea, which I can't do because I don't have a big enough boat. Legislation banning the use of seine nets was enforced by the park, resulting in the seizure of the illegal gear. But the park also recognized the importance of offering viable alternatives to local fishermen, establishing a fishing net exchange program 
and offering low-cost loans to buy alternative gear. We've got a program to try to exchange the destructive gears with the gears which we think they are somehow consider the environment here. Also we've got a soft loan scheme to enable the local fishermen who are not able to afford expensive gears in order to buy. In a bid to alleviate pressure on fish stocks from overfishing, the park has also tried to encourage a broader range of economic activities within the local community. Seaweed farming has been one of the success stories. Seaweed is used in the manufacture of cosmetics and pharmaceuticals and is a high value crop in the local economy. This non-destructive activity has generated incomes for the villages of Jibondo, which are significantly higher than the national average wage. We reduce the number of people who are fully engaged in fishing and they are find an alternative method of living. They can reduce also the hours they, they use to do fishing. So to promote this alternative is very, very good for the ecology and for the survival of, of the marine park. Our task is to work together with those communities to develop uh, effective ways in which they can still um, exploit the marine environment, they can still go fishing, they can still collect marine uh, organisms and so on, um, but in a way which is sustainable. I think if we get that across that message successfully, there's no uh, intrinsic reason why communities should not welcome the concept of a marine park in, in their area. Further north, the island of Chumbe off the coast of Zanzibar is home to another chapter in the battle to save the reefs. A privately owned marine sanctuary, funded by an ecotourism resort, has been established to protect one of the last pristine reefs. The project is the brainchild of former German aid worker Sibella Reidmiller. I'm a passionate diver and sailor, and I have been diving around East Africa for 20 years and uh, growingly desperate seeing coral reefs being blasted by dynamite fishing, which has been predominant for decades actually here. So I proposed to the government to have this gazetted as a park and uh, at the same time proposed that uh, I would uh, create a company and a small ecotourism uh, operation which would fund this. Central to the Chumbe project was the establishment of a no fishing exclusion zone to protect part of the reef, a move that was not greeted with enthusiasm by the local population. Certainly in the initial days there was a lot of sort of questions about that and well, hold on, can't we just fish there then? But a lot of that is awareness raising about what is coral reef, why should it be protected, how is it related to fisheries, you know. If people don't understand the basic concept that a coral reef is the, the nursery ground for fish, they're not going to understand the concept of why you're not letting them fish in a certain area. In the beginning it was very difficult to work here on Chumbe because the fishermen came to fish around this protected area and if we went to talk with them, the fishermen they wanted to fight with the rangers. Chumbe sought to win over the displaced fishermen by offering employment to the fishing villages most affected and attempting to raise awareness of the benefits of protecting the reef as a breeding ground for fish. The viability of Chumbe is entirely dependent on funds generated by ecotourism. And since the pollution generated by tourist resorts can often cause major problems for adjacent reefs, it was crucial to the success of the project that it should make zero impact on the environment. This philosophy is reflected in every aspect of the island's operation, particularly in the innovative design of its guest accommodation. We have seven bungalows on the island where people come and they stay in the bungalows and they pay money and that revenue generated by visitors is, is the only money that funds the entire project. We totally depend on money from visitors to run the whole thing. These buildings are really unique. They're 100% environmentally friendly. They generate their own water, they generate their own energy, and they dispose of that environmentally sustainably. Um, you can see the design is very unusual. We've got this huge roof area, very, very high surface area, and that basically is designed to catch rainwater. So in the big rains in April and again in November, the rain comes down, catches as much as possible on this huge roof area, and the rain comes down into these filters. 
So these funnels around the bungalow collect the actual rainwater and funnel it straight into one of these and is then stored underneath the bungalow itself. So each bungalow is raised on these large platforms, as you can see, and inside these big platforms is 15,000 litre system, and that contains the rainwater collected each rainy season. One of the biggest problems is sewage, sewage management and sewage waste. And for that, we've actually designed these toilets. They look like a regular toilet, but instead of having a flush system, which is very bad for huge amounts of wastewater, this kind of thing, we ask guests to throw down a couple of scoops of compost after they've been to the bathroom. This is in the roof of the bungalow, as you can see, as it narrows up to the top. On the top outside, you'll be able to see the photovoltaic panel. That's where we collect the energy, and it comes down to a battery which is stored here in the Technic Tower, and that battery provides for electricity 24 hours a day for lighting. One of the best things up here is, is the view out to the area. In order to assess the effectiveness of the protection of the reef, Chumbe has striven to include a research element in the project. Marine biologists from around the world have come to Chumbe to study the reef. Liz Tyler, currently completing a PhD at Oxford University in the UK, is looking specifically at the health of the fish stocks. I'm interested in the effectiveness of marine reserves in benefiting local fishermen, so how effective a protected area is um, at increasing the abundance of, of fish. I'm using um, underwater surveys to count and estimate the size of, of the fish inside and outside the reserve. And that will be both snorkeling and diving, depending on the depth. And I'm also tagging fish to see how far they move. And um, I'll recapture them both using traps and by doing underwater surveys, reciting tagged fish. Another Liz's project is being carried out with the assistance of the Marine Institute in Zanzibar. If her results show that protecting Chumbe's reef from fishing has been beneficial in raising the level of fish populations, then they'll play an important role in validating the whole Chumbe Island project. Got this one and this from as Oh, well. I see, it had this mark along the fin. It's just mm. the coloration is very different. Yeah. I've got different. basically four coloration. There's there's female one, and there, there, there are two color faces of male, probably. Right. Chumbe is a unique hybrid, which has attracted much attention from around the world and won environmental awards. But while it offers a model of eco-friendly tourism, how many of its lessons can be applied outside of a niche market of the wealthy, environmentally aware? Further north in Egypt, at the tip of the Sinai Desert, lie some of the most pristine reefs in the world. The area is sparsely populated with nomadic Bedouin and has been spared the depredations of overfishing. However, since the early 1980s, it has begun to attract large numbers of tourists. In an effort to preempt uncontrolled development, the Egyptian government, in conjunction with the European Union, established the Ras Mohammed National Park. When you want to develop tourism in an area, you have two options. Or you let the developer think for you, so they take the land, they think they are the owner of everything, and in the surroundings they do what they want. Or you consider that you have to manage first the developers, and this is what we have done. In this case, you have something suitable. So if you let the people all along this coast do what they want, you will have an hotel here. So after 20 years, this place is totally destroyed. Tourism is a, a threat and a promise to reefs, really. I mean, it has been a cause of some of the big problems. Tourist developments wanting to pick the last pristine beach on an island. Um, tourist developments so often pumping raw sewage into the waters just offshore. Um, sediments as they, as they build the tourist developments. Causes a lot of problems. The tremendous growth in tourism, which the reefs of Ras Mohammed inspired, was deliberately focused on the resort of Sharm El Sheikh. Here, the government was able to impose stringent controls on tourism's impact on the environment. The old discharge policy was the first step to have no impact from the hotels themselves, we could say. And so the old discharge, everything is going to be retreated. And the second thing, all the 
operators have been informed regularly by the park of the rules. Don't touch, don't collect, don't disturb, do not, do not, do not, we could say. But when they understand that they can sell 20 times the same products or 100 times the same products without any cost, and their hotel will be full all the time because they do this kind of job, they do it. The principal focus of tourism at Sharm was the growing popularity of recreational scuba diving. Dive tourists now flock to the resort in their thousands, a far cry from its relatively modest beginnings in the early 1980s. In peak season, you were talking about something between 200 and 500 divers a day. Now you're talking a bit different uh, because you have 69 diving centers, you have 286 boats, most of them are for commercial use uh, for the dive centers. Each boat can take up to 20 or 30 people, so you're talking in peak season an average of 2,000 to 2,500 divers a day. The reefs of Ras Mohammed currently generate an annual income for Sharm of $1 billion. This has created a mutual interest in their preservation amongst the diving operators. Now all the dives we'll be doing here this week are inside the National Park and there are certain rules and regulations we have to adhere to. We're not allowed to use gloves here. Gloves can encourage people to touch the coral. Touching the coral will kill the coral. Um, so we don't allow any touching whatsoever. No feeding the fish. Quite simply, it ruins their natural habitat. We want them to feed on what they normally feed on, not boiled eggs and crisps and things like that. So please make sure don't take any food into the water. To protect the reefs, 80% of Ras Mohammed is closed to diving. Mooring lines are provided at approved dive sites to prevent the destructive use of anchors. And the dive sites are regularly rested to allow coral to recover. These policies have enabled the park to remain relatively undamaged, in spite of some sites having up to 45,000 divers per annum. As the popularity of diving shows no signs of abating, the park authorities have continued to monitor possible adverse effects. Marine biologists are currently conducting video surveys of the reefs, looking at the health and diversity of the coral. For the moment, their findings seem to bear out the success of the park's strategies. The reefs within Ras Mohamed are much more preserved, definitely. There's no comparison with reefs, for example, uh, around Sharm el Sheikh. Some sites are totally destroyed, sites that were beautiful before. But that's part of development. Sharm el Sheikh is only 5% of the whole Sinai. And if everybody goes to the same places, that means the other places are preserved. There is no person who does not affect the environment, but there is somebody who affects it less than others. And we are trying to be that somebody who affects it less than the others. Typical of this commitment from the dive community has been the battle to save the coral from a natural predator. In recent years, the reefs have been subject to plague-like infestations of crown of thorns starfish. These creatures which feed on coral have caused massive destruction on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and are a recurrent problem in Egypt. The crown of thorns is a bit of a special case because you cannot actually kill the sea star. Uh, if you cut it in two, then two crown of thorns are going to form. If you cut it in three, you have three crown of thorns. So the only solution was to collect these sea stars and get them out of the water. Lacking the manpower or resources to deal with the crown of thorns, the park relied heavily on the efforts of the dive centers. Dive instructors and volunteers collected over 50,000 starfish from the reefs in a single year. But while natural predators like the crown of thorns represent a tremendous problem for afflicted reefs, there is an even greater threat to the global ecology of coral, and one which has no easy solution, global warming. The corals are extremely sensitive to uh, temperature changes, and, and they, they exhibit a stress response, which is known as coral bleaching. The corals have, living within their tissues, a microscopic algae 
and there's a very tight relationship between the coral and the algae. For some reason, this relationship breaks down when the corals get too hot. They expel the algae, they go bleached white colour, which is in fact their skeleton underneath becoming visible, a white skeleton. And that's known as coral bleaching. In 1998, in the wake of El Nino, the world experienced a catastrophic coral bleaching event as pulses of warm water swept around the tropics and settled on the central area of the Indian Ocean for a period of several months. It was actually very demoralizing for our rangers uh, to protect individual corals against anchors being thrown on top of them or being broken by careless uh, snorkelers or being uh, slashed by, by fishermen who want to chase fish out of the coral rocks and uh, doing this coral by coral, really protecting very physically and then seeing uh, the whole reef bleaching within a matter of weeks. One or two reefs in particular were badly affected by the coral bleaching in 1998 after the, the El Nino in 97. Uh, those reefs um, suffered very high coral mortality and even if you go there today you can see a lot of evidence of standing dead coral which is still in si still there but, but, but obviously dead. Five percent of the world's coral reefs bleached and went on and died. Um, 80 to 90 percent of all the corals died from the Maldives through the Chagos Archipelago and across the Seychelles. So this was a huge area, completely unprecedented, caught the scientists completely by surprise. Although reefs have shown some signs of recovery, the destructive potential of global warming still hangs over this most precious of natural resources and threatens to undermine the important work now going on to reverse centuries of ecological devastation. So what then can the future hold for the fragile reef? We have so many problems facing the world's reefs. I think I'm probably quite pessimistic about the overall world of reefs. But I think we have the knowledge now to protect at least some of them. And so I'm hopeful that we're going to have some reefs for future generations, not as much as I would like. We're all extremely concerned about the impacts of climate change which is hanging over us as a little bit of a, an unknown. I think in the future uh, we will still have coral reefs. I think over the entire planet they will exist in a state that is very different to that which existed some 20 or 25 years ago. We will undoubtedly lose a large proportion of the coral reefs that we have. We Indeed, we have already lost a large proportion. There will be further losses. If an atlas is written in 100 years' time, it may be smaller. It will make great reference to the wonderful state that they existed in previously. And it will also ask a question of why on earth wasn't anything done to prevent this decline.